Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. Today's class is all about the Constitutional Convention. So we're gonna do Constitution 101, how did we get the Constitution? So my name is Curry Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm here today with one of our top scholars, Nicholas Mazbek. Nicholas, do you wanna say hi to everybody before we kick off? Hi everybody. So Nicholas and I love questions. So as we go through class today, if there's a question or a clarification that pops in your head, feel free to add it to the chat or the Q&A, and we'll pull from there and answer questions as we go along and make sure all the learning is nice and clear. So to get things started, I thought we would start with the Constitution today. So when we think about the Constitution, and this is actually our exact copy from our interactive Constitution, but what is the Constitution? It starts with those three beautiful words, we the people, and, which is a part of the preamble, it's the actual structural constitution or original constitution. Those are some of the words you'll hear us say today. It has seven articles and then 27 amendments. We think of those first 10 amendments as the Bill of Rights. But today we're gonna start before this constitution, way before this constitution, say 233 years ago. And we're gonna answer these questions. So why did the founding generation decide to write a constitution? How did the U.S. Constitution differ from the Articles of Confederation? And if you don't know what the Articles of Confederation are, don't worry. We'll talk about it in a minute. And what are some of the main compromises that happened at the convention, the convention that happened in that awesome building behind me? So, Nicholas, as we dive into this Constitution, can you give us a little foundation about before the Constitutional Convention? So before the, uh, May 25th, 1787, what was going on in our country? You know, end of the Civil, end of the Civil War, end of the Revolutionary War, before the Convention, were we doing well? What were we like? Yeah, so um, I think there's a few things to highlight here to think about, right? Um, so one, I'll just say, Curry, that it's really good for students to think about that question you actually started with, which is what is the constitution? The only reason I bring that up is it's not obvious what the answer is. So think about it, right? Are we talking about a fundamental law that's unbreakable? Are we talking about a contract between the people and their rulers? Um, what, what is the constitution? Because it's new. And that's kind of what I'm getting at to start with, right? Is keep in mind, first off, written constitutions, new thing, right? So the first ones were in 1776. Those were the state constitutions that were drafted beginning in May 1776, just before the Declaration of Independence. So those are the first written constitutions in the world, at least in the Western world. And um, uh, the 1787, right, that's the first national constitution because the British constitution was and is unwritten. There is no written British constitution. It's just based on precedent, things that had happened before. Um, so I had to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So like be super tactical about this. What is a constitution? It's the written laws of the land? But that's actually the central question, right? Is it is it just written laws of the land or are they fundamental? Meaning fundamental in the sense that in the 18th century, they would have differentiated between just the normal law, right, which can be changed regularly by courts and the legislator, and then fundamental law. The reason fundamental would have been different is not only because it was more difficult to change, but also because it emanated from the people themselves. In other words, part of the very concept of popper sovereignty we're going to talk about with we the people is this notion that because um, power flows from them, therefore, if the constitution is fundamental law, ultimately derived from the people, it should be hard to change, right? So that tells you something about the answer to that question and why it's difficult, right? Is um, because it's new, answering exactly what this thing is, is actually part of what's going on in 1787 and then thereafter, right? Is what did we just write? And now how yeah. do we deal with it to make a new government? So it's, it's great for students to keep that in mind in terms of asking that question because I gave you an answer but it also, I'm also trying to give you the context of they're debating this at the time, right? And so we go back to 1776. I just said we had these state constitutions, right? They're the first written ones. So what that means is in that 11 years be between 1776 and 1787, 
you have this massive uh, set of experimentations, right, in terms of what democratic constitutional government should look like. And a lot of those states are attempting uh, pretty legislative dominant uh, forms of government. And that includes in Pennsylvania, but in a lot of other new states. So one thing is the lesson from state governments, which is actually when the legislator has so much power, it leads to corruption. It leads to backroom dealings, right? It's actually not good for the people. But we have the sense that maybe that's more direct democracy. But for a lot of the framers like James Madison, the lesson is actually, it's not clear that the people get more power this way, but it seems that it actually makes government worse in a variety of ways. What's happened at so, the national level is the yeah, Articles of Confederation, still, right? So there's so the articles, right? Yeah. So real quick, they're acting like independent countries yep. almost. But they yeah, because are, that's the articles where we bring those in, it. right? Yeah. So the so, Articles so of Confederation. Acting alone and acting together in certain ways. Got it. Articles. Go it's to the, these guys. The next. notion is you have it, the League of Friendship, right? Which is to say they would have called it more like a compact theory. What we mean by that as a compact is like an international treaty or, you know, just between sovereign or independent states. Therefore, you can see that setup suggests that the states themselves maintain more power than the national government. And under their Articles of Confederation, that was certainly true. Um, there wasn't really an executive. There wasn't a president. There wasn't a Supreme Court. Um, and Congress, under the Articles, didn't have powers of taxation. They couldn't really pay the army during the Revolutionary War because they couldn't tax to do so. So they had to ask states to do so. They had to ask states to give quotas of men. They couldn't really form an army themselves, right? They couldn't do what was thought to be the basic functions of government, right? That, that was part of the problem is like, well, how can you have a strong enough government to go to war, for instance, mm -hmm. if you can't even raise funds to pay for an army? How can you make treaties with other major nations if you can't do the basic functions of what we would call statecraft, um, which is one of the big problems in the 1780s, right? Is, okay, there's the war debt, right? Because I just mentioned some of these issues. It falls on the states to deal with all this uh, debt that is accumulated for the war, which is a lot of it is now worthless, essentially. And that means for people like Daniel Shays, who were members um, who are soldiers in the Revolutionary War, uh, they're in heavy debt because uh, they haven't really gotten paid. They haven't really seen that money. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the treaty power I noted is that was another problem in the 1780s, right? The notion that under the Articles, the government couldn't make good deals and the British government really kind of had us underwater, you know, that they were taking advantage of the United States. How can we survive as a country if we can't, we don't have a strong enough government to get better deals. So what does Shays' Rebellion come out of? It yeah, comes out and, of this. And give us like the energy that it leads to the Constitutional Convention. Right. I know Shays' Rebellion is one of the pieces, but I it know is. all of our students love to learn about Shays' Rebellion. Well, too. and it's and it's one of many moments, right? And it's, keep in mind is Shays' Rebellion isn't like the only moment of potential violence or uh, demonstrations or things like that, right? Those those do happen. But Shays is a big moment because I, I've just talked about all this buildup of frustration amongst the founders over the Articles of Confederation, which happens during the war and thereafter, right? So Shays is a big moment because you've got essentially a decade of frustration built up. Um, they've already had the Annapolis Convention in September of 1786, which is where they agreed to meet in May 1787 to uh, consider amendments to the articles, but really to try to draft a new constitution. So they were already thinking about, we need a stronger government. We need a stronger union. So what does Shays do? Shays is almost a rhetorical moment, right? Because it, it, you can craft a message around, look at this threat, look at how bad it is, right? Isn't it clear to everyone that we need a stronger government because there was no United States army that went in to put down Shays' rebellion. It was the Massachusetts militia. It was the Massachusetts governor who had to deal with this problem. There was no national government to help out. Um, and why were they rebellion? 
Well, they said why they were doing so, because they were in crushing debt. And there was no national legislation or even uh, monetary policy to deal with the problem, right? Congress wasn't capable of doing either of those things. So it was left to the states to put together legislation to deal with this problem. And that's why they were rebelling, is they were demanding more, right? A debt relief program, essentially. And so they kind of, yeah, and just kind of as we, as we see this moment, we hear so much about it. I think it's so important what you said. This isn't the only thing. This is almost like the tipping point. Yes. But it isn't the only thing, but it does shake up everybody. And it yes. says, okay, we really need to have this convention that we already planned in Philadelphia. Yeah, um, you think but- of George Washington as an example, right? Is that Washington uh, is not sure he wants to go to the convention. He has to be convinced by Madison and others. And he's getting letters from former uh, military officers under him, including Henry Knox, who will be the first secretary of war. He's writing them and telling them, no, Shay's Rebellion is worse than you think. It's terrible. And if we don't stop this, there will be more and more and we'll have civil war. So it's it's friends, right, who are telling him yeah. this is really bad. And of course, people see these letters, right? They know about these things of, oh, my God, the country, the country's leaders just they think we're on the edge of falling apart of civil war. Right. So that's the image. Right. So mm-hmm. what can people agree on is that the Articles of Confederation, not great need to be replaced, probably. And we're at a moment of potential crisis, right? And so that and sets is, up where we get yeah, to. Yeah, and right? I, think, I think it's so important because like this is a lot of adults that we talk to through our classes and at the center don't realize kind of this moment of crisis. We kind of sugarcoat from declaration to constitution and we don't talk about this like boiling point of right around this time period. So it's great that our students know about it. So the convention begins in May. We don't get enough people a quorum until May 25th. Yes. And it runs from May 25th to September 17th. I'm going to call it a long, hot, smelly summer for the convention years. But you've got some big names in that room. So Nick, before we dive into what they do there, can can we talk about kind of some big names in the room and students? If you recognize anybody in the picture, feel free to shout it out. I will ask you guys now, who do you think is in that gorgeous blue, looks like velour, but it's probably velvet um, suit Mm. as well. Um, You mean the man who's seated? Yeah, the man who's seated in that beautiful blue velvet, crushed velvet look going on. Because I already gave one of them away, right? And and that's that Washington Washington does come and Washington is president of the convention and it's important because students have to realize that at this point, George Washington is the most famous American and he is the most respected leader in the country. And uh, that means that even in Britain, I always, I have heard this fact and I think it's amazing that the British are the first to have a statue to George Washington, not the Americans. Uh, so there was, he has, in other words, he has world respect. And so him being at the convention in and of itself gives it respectability. It makes it legitimate, right? So his presence in and of itself matters, right? Because Washington doesn't say a lot during the debates. See, he sometimes pushes them one way or another or gives agreement where he thinks it matters, but he's mostly listening. But his presence there is important. And that other gentleman seated, that's Ben Franklin. So if there's one other person who right there with Washington in terms of respect, both in our country and other countries, right? Is a renowned figure that represents the potential for American democracy, it's Ben Franklin, right? Because he already had a career as an inventor and newspaper man and then diplomat, right? He has all these things and and he's there. And real quick, who's the two that aren't there before we roll Uh, in? Oh yes, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And of course they're both jealous. They're in Europe on diplomatic missions, but why are they jealous? Because they're going to spend years sort of acting like, God, I wish I was there because Adams had written the Massachusetts constitution, which was hugely influential on our federal constitution. So I think for Adams, it was, uh, I would have gotten more credit if I was there. And Jefferson is constantly (laughs) writing to Madison and saying, Hey, tell me more about what's happening. Tell me about the debates. Hey, why isn't there a bill of rights? So you can see, they really kind of wish 
they were involved, even if he likes being in France. <laughs> so real quick, and we'll get through how they got there in a second, but here's, yes. the, here's the art of the image for you, Nick. Um, mm -hmm. What did they do on the Constitution, just so we're clear, the Constitution by the end of September 17, 1787, has those words, we the people on it, has the preamble and the seven articles. Just so we remember, it does not have any of the amendments. They come after it's ratified. So no Bill of Rights until afterwards. I just like to point it out to our students so we see what is the structural constitution, yes. those seven articles, and then what is are the amendments and they're added after. So want to do a real quick walkabout through the, um, the constitution and those articles, Nick, and then we'll dive into the debate. Yeah, yeah, we can do that really quickly. I mean, the preamble yeah. we've already kind of alluded to, which is to say this notion of popular sovereignty is being kind of a mission statement, right? The preamble is the mission statement. There's a preamble in the Declaration of Independence, too. It's the same thing, right? It operates as a, these are our founding ideals, and this is what this is about, right? So we the people, that's popular sovereignty, right? Power derives from the people. And it also says the purposes, which is for things like the common defense, right? If you read the whole preamble, it says, here are the purposes of making this new national government, right? It's, it's from popular sovereignty, and it's because we need uh, things like the objects of common defense. So that's the preamble. Article one, two, and three, those outline our branches, right? We have our three branches. We have our separation of powers and checks and balances. So article one, that's the legislative power of Congress. Article two, that's the presidency or the executive power. And article three is the judiciary, which is where we get the Supreme Court from. Article four sets up the relationships between states. Um, that's where uh, things like the admission of the new states are, the privileges and immunities clause, which about rights citizens between states. Um, and then uh, at this, uh, this is also where like rendition comes from at this point, since obviously the, uh, the fugitives clause, which was called the fugitive slave clause, although it's not called that in the text, um, has a different meaning now. Um, Article five sets out the process for amending the constitution. So just for everyone, for my, the you know, basic setup there is you need two thirds of Congress and three fourths of the states. Uh, Article 6 establishes what's known as the Supremacy Clause, which says that essentially federal law is supreme over state law. So that's pretty important. Uh, it also bans religious tests for offices, and it sets about the oath of office that the president, all members of Congress, members of the courts, all federal officers take. And what is that is to swear and uphold this constitution of the United States. And then Article 7, that is essentially a one-time deal, which is setting up the ratification for this constitution. Why do they need to do that? Well, the articles actually say it requires 13 of 13 states unanimity in order to amend the articles. So a little Article 7 there is to say, okay, well, yeah, let's shift those rules a little bit. Let's make it 9 of 13. So it's a super Way majority. better. <laughs> yeah, yes. so way better. They, they knew they had to put it in there. But yes. were, to get to this, it, again, yes. long, hot, smelly summer, and there were a lot of debates and compromises. So the uh, Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise, the Electoral College, and then the Three-Fifth Compromise in the slave trade. So I know there's a lot to go over in these debates because these are the key things we want to talk about. What were they debating, fighting about? discussing and compromising around, um, because that's what you really have in the base of the constitution or what comes out of these compromises. So one of the key things that we get to the Connecticut compromise and we think about it, it's about how we're represented. So many of these debates right. are how we're represented. So maybe we start there. Do you wanna start with Madison and Wilson and the representation? Yes. Great, you go. Well, let's let's say, let's say two things just to start off with. One is um, we should even say why are we talking about compromise, right? It's just keep in mind, right? Is they're doing a pretty big thing here in secret. They are writing a brand new constitution, and you have representatives from everybody except for I believe Rhode Island didn't send anybody. Um, and so you have small states, large states. Uh, major slaveholding states, northern states that have already moved towards um, more freedom, 
right? So in other words, you have a variety of interests, right? Geographically, ideologically, et cetera, right? I all, I, all I do to point that out is to say, there's a political element to this in the sense that it's politics in that they're all representing different things. And they're coming with states telling them what we want you to think about. Now, I bring that up with representation, for instance, because if you're a small state, if you're Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth from Connecticut, your state has told you, they've given you literal instructions as representatives of what we care about. What do they care about? We don't want New York to destroy our economy anymore with their taxes. And we want equal representation. We don't want large states to run the government. We want a voice in government because we feel like if they do, it's not real representative democracy because all those small states in New England, their voices will never be heard and that will only get worse over time. So that gets you to representation in the sense of why was this such a big deal? Because if there is really one debate that's crucial throughout the hot summer, it is representation. It keeps coming up over and over again. And the reason is something that goes back all the way to the 1760s, right? If we thought about the movement for independence, at its core, what is it about? Is figuring out what representation means according to new democratic theory. They are trying to you, figure this out. And when you talk about representation, just to be really transparent, we're talking about your voice and agency within your government. So your government is supposed to represent you and kind of be a voice for you, but right. you need to be heard. So this is, this is why they're debating it, because it's so important that the individual and the state is heard in this balance of these new 13 states all working together. Now you've got like, you did a great kind of layout of some big states and some small states. And this is where we see the compromise, the first compromise yes. come up. It's between Virginia and New Jersey's plans and big state Virginia. It was huge gang. Remember yes. it was Virginia and West Virginia. It was huge. And then New Jersey comparably pretty small at the time, not in population, but in size. Yeah, I mean, Virginia is the power center of the mm. universe for the United States at this point um, in a cool. variety of ways, right? So yes, New York is a growing city and it's important and it's cosmopolitan, but it's, it's still not very big and Philadelphia is too, but Virginia is a power center. And uh, the Virginia plan, that's Madison. So James Madison has essentially spent a year thinking about all this stuff, right? He famously writes to Jefferson, and Jefferson sends him a shipload of boats going back to antiquity, you know, research the Greeks, the Romans, all attempts at democracy in history to try to figure out the big questions like representation and what it should be. And so Madison has a plan that he shows up with in terms of, here's what I think a, a democratic republic should look like. And that's the Virginia plan, right? It's the embodiment of it, right? So if Curry, you want to show them, sure. uh, show them that, right? So you can see some of those pieces do stick, right? Legislative branch consisting of two chambers. We call that bicameralism, right? We do have that, right? Um, each state being represented on, uh, in proportion to their size. Well, we're going to get to that, right? Um, because that notion is it should be in favor of large states, basically, that uh, it should be by population and not by state. Um, the national legislator would have the power to address issues that were beyond the ability of any state government to handle. That's more or less true. But then that next piece, we don't have that, right? Madison wanted the national legislator to have a veto over state laws. So we're not even talking about a presidential veto, right? We're talking about a congressional veto over state laws. And that was X'd out too. And um, the Virginia plan has some other pieces too about the presidency we can maybe get to. But the point there, right, is that Madison is saying proportional. The New Jersey plan, New Jersey is another small state, right? So keep this in mind. We're talking about what I said before, right? Small state interests. So William Patterson, his plan is one house, right? He doesn't want bicameralism. He wants unicameralism, a single house of Congress. And it's based on equal representation, meaning that all states get a vote regardless of size. Um, now, he would agree to expand the powers of the national government. In other words, the agreement here was we need a stronger national government. We don't disagree about that. Some of us are more worried about taking away too many state powers. 
But the real core concern here is what representation looks like vis-a-vis -vis the states. So those are the two plans. What is the Connecticut compromise? I just said Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth, those are your, uh, uh, your major representatives from um, uh, Connecticut. And the, the compromise actually is pretty far reaching, but the big one over representation is the one we have, right? Is, okay, the house will be based on Madison's idea that will be proportional representation based on population according to a census every 10 years. And the Senate will be based on equal representation, two per state, equal, right? Um, and then at that time, senators were also elected by the state legislators, which flowed from the same notion, right? Is maintaining the equal powers of the states themselves is better representatives of the people, right? Keep in mind that this that popular sovereignty that is animating so many of these ideas is also animating this very discussion. Uh, so that's awesome. that's representation. So we have two big two, two more debates to go through really quickly. So I thought we could I see our time. The, so yep. Let's, yeah, uh, let's do two and two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A president's over debate. So they yes. have a lot of debates about how to do a president. They're super worried about it. Should it be one person? Should it be multiple people? Yep. But, you know, they really come down to breaking it down pretty quickly. So I'll give you this to kind of guide you through what do they wind up coming up with? They knew going into this that Washington was going to be the first president. So they felt yes. good about that. Um, but who's going to be the president after Washington? And how do they make sure it doesn't turn into a, a monarch, you know, a king that is going to take over? And how do they make sure there's a balance between what we just talked about, the lawmaking body, and the executive branch? This is Article 2 here. So the last one was Article 1, uh, first article. This is Article 2. So real quick, walk us yes. through, and then we'll jump into how are all these connected with the debate over slavery? Yeah, so, I mean, this is connected to the debate over representation, for sure. So, like, we should just say, right, this links to what we just talked about. Um, the other thing is it's also about the debate over what a democratic republic or a constitutional republic should look like. In other words, how democratic should it be? Why do I bring that up? Because selection of the presidency, those who did not want a recollection, one of their primary arguments is this will lead to demagogues, right? So if a monarch is bad, a tyrant is worse. And so we do not want presidents to not only have too much power, but to, to derive it by essentially lying to the people or to stir them up and stir up particular interests against the public interest, because virtue, right? The concern is, how do we have the next person after Washington be as virtuous? In other words, when we say that, we mean disinterested in the sense that they're publicly minded. They're about the common good, not about peculiar interests. How do we ensure that happens, right? And so selection was thought to be a pretty big deal. Like they rejected the congressional selection because they thought that will lead to a cabal in the words of the great Governor Morris, right? Because it would be corrupt. They would be dependent on each other. It would lead to oligarchy or aristocracy. It would be bad. You're going right? to have to define cabal because it's a great <laughs> Cabal word. means <laughs> a hidden, yeah, hidden group up top, right? Think of it as, we think of conspiracies, right? That's what it is. Yeah. It's, it's like it's conspiracy of select group. few making the decisions for all, right? That's bad. You don't want to have that. That's not democratic. So the the basic summary of all that is the electrical, the electrical, the electoral <laughs> college is, is, the uh, the compromise, right? It's it's not really originally proposed by anyone. Madison sort of throws out a similar idea. Wilson is the biggest advocate. Uh, Wilson was originally, James Wilson was an advocate for direct election. Um, the Electoral College basically came out of a committee that was trying to deal with these issues they couldn't resolve, right? And Wilson thought, you know what? That's a good compromise because it's far closer to what I want because the people still get a voice. They still get a vote. It just goes through the states, right, through a different institution. In other words, it, you know, there's just that, what we would call a mediating institution. It's a lot better than letting Congress pick or having a lottery or something else like that, right? He said, all those other systems are far worse. So this is much closer to what I wanted. So let's go with that compromise, right? So he didn't see it as middle of the road. He said closer is to what he wanted. So that's the Electoral College. I think that we can let that spin us into the um uh, the other debates which is to say 
representation in and of itself, of course, is related because the Southern states are demanding, um, not only large states want proportional representation, they want part of that math to be that their slaves will count for full persons, right? In other words, we will get greater representation if it's proportional representation, if you also count slaves as part of the population. And it's not just about it. I mean, I know representation is a huge part of this, but it's also about the debates over slavery in general. And I know Gouverneur Morris is like, how can we? How well, can we? Think of it this way, country? right, Curry? So, it, in other words, the debate comes up because they're talking about representation. But that's also a moment for Gouverneur Morris, for even Wilson at times, and Rufus King of Massachusetts, who was also mm -hmm. one of the strongest voices to call out hypocrisy where they saw it. So, I think one of the great things to keep in mind here is the uh, historian of slavery, James Oakes put it, is between 1776 and 1787, something had changed. What had changed is a lot of states had actually now moved away from slavery. They had, some had banned it, some had adopted gradual emancipation, but a lot of the North had already started to reject it. So that means that there was going to be compromise of some sort and everyone knew it because the only way to have a union of all 13 states was to not fully abolish slavery because South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina, none of them are agreeing to it. Maryland's not agreeing to that. Delaware is not agreeing to that, right? Um, you don't have that majority, but you do have more of a Northern strength of saying we need to push back. So when the opportunity comes up, that means Morris is going to say, so let me understand what you're, what you're arguing. So what you're saying is they're not persons when you're making a property claim over them according to state law, but when you want greater representation in Congress, they are a person. So which is it? Which I, this is why I love Governor Morris because he just <laughs> calls it like it is. <laughs> right, and so their whole point was, no, they shouldn't count or they, they, they must be persons, right? That's the issue, right? So what is the, where does the three-fifths compromise come from? Well, it actually comes from a similar debate that was had a couple of years beforehand in 1784, which was about taxing. And in that case, the sides were flipped. The Southern states said, no, 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 no. We don't, you know, we don't want slaves counted for purposes of taxation. You know, that's, no, no, no. And the Northern states wanted, uh, they said, they made the argument of, well, if you're going to treat them as property, and we don't believe they should be, but if you're going to, then they must be counted for taxation, right? So that language was there, and they essentially drew from that and said that will be the compromise. And I was Roger Sherman again of said, okay, we'll use this old language. We'll see that in what we call the fugitive slave clause that was also pulled from known language that was put in, although that was less of a compromise because representation was the bigger debate and therefore was the greater opportunity for the pushback. The slave trade clause is similar in that respect, right? This was a lengthy debate about whether or not Congress would be given the power to ban the international slave trade. So we've talked about this in prior classes. The Atlantic slave trade uh, by this point has been built up for centuries. And uh, even in Virginia, where slavery is very powerful, it's a social institution, um, many of the representatives who own slaves who were at Philadelphia argued against the slave trade. Now, why would they do that? Well, the sense was that the slave trade in and of itself was particularly in inhumane, right? In other words, there are people already here in the country, and we're, we're going to figure out how we can eventually get rid of slavery here. But the trade itself makes that worse. And the, car, the treating of humans as cargo is more, almost more obviously inhumane and illiberal, right? So they yeah. could point to that, right? So how so, do we get the compromise, right? So you still have members of South Carolina and Georgia like Charles Pinckney who, are, who don't want Congress to have any power. I know you don't like Mr. Pinckney. You're not the only I one. Not. <laughs> People didn't like Charles Madison. Pinckney at the time, Curry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily popular. Uh, but this, so what is the compromise here ultimately is that Congress was given the power to fully ban that trade, but they were not given that power for 20 years. So January 1st, 1808, President Thomas Jefferson signs the bill. 
and that that tr slave trade is banned. But it does mean that there is a period of time there, 20 years, in which that trade continues because those southern uh, states that were most invested in slavery, like we, we talk about slave societies, right? The ones that were not going to emancipate or move towards any emancipation. Um, we're not going to, we're going to do everything they could to try to push back against them. And frankly, Charles Pinkney was mad that Congress was given any power because for someone like Ben Franklin, as soon as the government was set up, that was an opportunity to say, you know, Congress has some powers in here that might allow them to get rid of slavery. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us back to the beginning, September 17th, 1787. Many men in this room sign it. Three refuse to sign it to the centers. Yes. And it goes to the states for ratification. So as we wrap up class today, just a few things for all of you to remember is that when we think about our constitution, that supreme law of the land that's written down that gives power derived from we the people, it isn't ratified until June 21st, 1788. So oddly enough, it's one of the few times we celebrate the signing of it but not the adoption of it. So it does take some years after that. Bill of Rights is fully ratified on December 15th, 1791. And the last amendment, is that 1993? What 92. year is it? 92, thank you, yeah. Nick. I couldn't remember that last one. So students, we just walked through that constitutional convention, all of those seven articles, the preamble, and the big debate, the Shays Rebellion that leads us there, the base during the convention and what we walk away with when we just look at this section of the constitution. So Nick, thank you so much. You did a perfect job. We were almost perfectly on time and we got through all the big debates. Yes. So thank you so much students. We will hang out afterwards if you have any questions, but you've been super quiet today. So I'm going to doubt it, but we'll still be here. Thank you, Nick. All right. Bye.